Everyone is asking today, we're going to give you answers. What you need to know about LSU's signing class, NIL, and transfer portal strategy. It's Locked on LSU. Let's go. You are Locked on LSU, your daily podcast on the LSU Tigers. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Okay, let's get it. It is Locked on LSU, your team every day. I'm your host, Matt Moscona. Thanks so much for making us your first listen. We are free, available wherever you get podcasts, of course, on YouTube as well. So please subscribe. Today's episode brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Brian Kelly met with reporters on Monday for his weekly press conference and... Throughout the course of that press conference, it became less about recapping Vanderbilt or previewing Oklahoma and more about roster construction for 2025. His comments have gotten a lot of conversation. They've honestly brought up an awful lot of questions. So I want to dive into each of those answers that he gave today or that he gave. And I want to give you a clarification for each of them a, a easy to understand explanation and as much information as I am free to divulge about everything from the revenue share to NIL to transfer portal approach, et cetera. So here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll go through the questions and the answers that Brian Kelly gave, and then I'll give you an explanation following each. It started when he was asked about quarterback. Now, keep in mind, He cannot speak specifically about Bryce Underwood. Until a prospect has signed, a coach cannot specifically talk about a recruit by name. So the question was asked in generalities with not having a recruit committed in this class, did LSU still plan on signing a quarterback? Give a listen. Yeah, I think we'll always look at taking a quarterback each year and and we'll most likely take a quarterback again this year. Um, we, We look at the calendar year a little bit differently than just, you know, December. You know, we have a February signing period. We have um, a transfer portal. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to look at that um, and, and see how that best fits our roster. Um, but I can tell you this, that the overall roster is much more important than one particular position. As much as we want to take a quarterback at this position, um, I think what's more important is the overall health of the roster. And and so uh, if it ends up being that we do take a quarterback, that's great. But I think our eye is on the strength of the entire roster. Okay, let's talk about those two things. Let's talk about quarterback and let's talk about the strength of the roster. And I want to start with quarterback. Okay, you're at a point now where you are a week, uh, as we record this, from the early signing period. All of the elite prospects in this 2025 class are committed elsewhere. LSU could certainly try to go make an, an offer to somebody, but the bottom line is you would have to, in effect, do the same thing that Michigan just did to you for Bryce Underwood, and I don't know that that option is there. The best option for LSU is get Garrett Nussmeyer to return. And if LSU feels good about Garrett Nussmeyer returning, then that really clears the deck because LSU is going to go into the transfer portal to add a quarterback. The question is, are they going to add a starting caliber quarterback or depth? And if Garrett Nussmeyer returns, they're adding depth. Someone who is young, maybe one year somewhere else, jumps into the portal, comes to LSU with the opportunity to sit in 2025 and compete in 2026. If Garrett Nussmeyer goes pro, and you better believe LSU already has a pretty good sense of that. More on that in just a second, by the way, from Brian Kelly. If if, if Garrett Nussmeyer was intending to go pro, then LSU is going to be ham in the portal trying to get a starting caliber player the way they went and got Jaden Daniels in 2022 when Brian Kelly arrived. So that's one point, which is the quarterback piece. Now, the other part of that, and by the way, financially, Garrett Nussmeyer, I would estimate, knowing his NIL money, his NIL figure for 2024, I would estimate his bottom three starting quarterbacks in the SEC and NIL. He will get a bump in 2025. The number that I have been shown with my own two eyes is nowhere near what they were going to pay Bryce Underwood. 
but it is still a very respectable number for any college athlete, quarterback or not. So if Garrett Nussmeyer comes back, there's an incentive for him to do it and come back, back to LSU and to be the starting quarterback. Now, the other part of that is the roster as a whole, which Brian Kelly told you about. Now, remember, if you were here when Bryce Underwood decommitted, I did an episode. If you didn't uh, catch that, I would highly recommend you go back and check it out. LSU's path forward. And the example I gave you was 2016 LSU. And 2016 LSU in the bowl game played Lamar Jackson in Louisville. And that day, they held Lamar Jackson and Louisville to nine points. Lamar ran 26 times for 33 yards. Let me say that again. The two-time NFL MVP who won the Heisman Trophy on a three-loss team because he was that magnificent ran 26 times for 33 yards against LSU. Why? Arden Key, Devon Gottschall, Kendall Beckwith, Duke Riley, Deion Jones, Tredavious White, Dante Jackson, Jamal Adams. You had an NFL roster. LSU right now does not have an NFL roster on the defensive side of the ball. They've got to go fix that. That's what Brian Kelly is saying. We can win with Garrett Nussmeyer at quarterback. We can go into the portal and find a quarterback. Look at Notre Dame right now. Notre Dame, his former school, is 10-1 and one on the verge of the playoff with Riley Leonard as their quarterback who can barely complete a forward pass. Go fix your roster as a whole. That's what Brian Kelly is saying right there. And with Bryce Underwood's decommitment, it frees up a million five in money you had allocated this year for Bryce Underwood to go spend on other positions. Yes, to solidify your 2025 class, but also to go into the portal where they already had money allocated. Speaking of which, Brian Kelly was asked if they planned on being aggressive in the portal when they weren't a year ago. This is the answer that got most people's attention and most people excited. We'll be very aggressive. Um, you know, you, you, I think everybody that's followed us knows that we weren't very aggressive in the transfer portal. We put together a defensive line using minimal resources. Um, we, we've really put ourselves in a position, um, and, and, and I'll use this term loosely, to stay well under the cap. Um, so we could be quite aggressive uh, this year, uh, and we, um, we will be very aggressive uh, in, in that area, as well as bringing in 16 mid-years. Um, we're going to have 16 mid-years. Uh, we think that the program in terms of the culture and the standards are such that we can do that now, uh, where we can bring in 16 freshmen and maybe one of, if not the largest, uh, transfer portal classes as well. Okay. Two things he said there. One was talking about a year ago staying, quote, unquote, under the cap. The other thing he talked about there was culture. Okay. The under the cap piece and the culture piece kind of work together. Now, a year ago, and this is where I'm going to disclose stuff to you that you may have heard and may not have heard. A year ago, when the season ended, LSU felt very confident they were going to get Makai Wingo and Mason Smith to return. LSU had half a million dollar offers in NIL to each of them to return. They also felt like they were going to get Bo Davis from Texas. Now, if you remember, Bo Davis initially put out a tweet saying he was staying at Texas. Mason Smith, Makai Wingo promptly entered the draft. A week later, LSU was able to re-engage with Bo Davis. They got him to come to LSU. It was too late for Mason and Makai. You had this a million dollars allocated for these two players. That's now on the table. They're gone to the draft. And it's too late in the portal window now to go pursue any of the big fish. So now you have funds but you have to go be aggressive in the second portal window. Well, there were two players on the defensive line. Brian Kelly mentioned defensive line specifically. You heard him say it there, that they had limited resources on their defensive line. Well, they went into the second portal window, and there were two players. It was Dominic Williams, who ended up at Oklahoma, and it was Simeon Barrow, who ended up at Miami. And LSU went after both of them. Dominic Williams asked for $1.2 million out of the portal. But Brian Kelly mentioned culture. This is what he's talking about. LSU's highest paid player in NIL this year is Will Campbell at half a million dollars. 
how in the world Brian Kelly's thinking at the time. And that's when he made the comment, if you remember, where he said, we're not just going to go buy a player. We're not just going to go buy a roster. If you remember him saying it, this is what he was talking about. Dominic Williams wanted 1.2. In his mind, he's thinking, how can I pay someone who's never taken a snap for me more than double the amount of my best player who's my three-year starter at left tackle? That was the culture piece. Fast forward now when Brian Kelly's saying, we have a good culture, don't need, well, Will Campbell's going pro. And there's no, there's no sacred cow on this LSU team for 2025. There's no one who is so far in advance and far and away better than everyone else that, that, that you can't justify bringing in an elite pair, a player uh, for more money than what you're paying that, that player currently on the team. Now, there's guys you'd love to see return. You'd love to see Mason Taylor. You'd love to see Emory Jones. You'd love to see Harold Perkins return. And there's a good chance LSU could get any or all of them back. We'll wait and see how it goes. But the questions you were having about your returning players a year ago, like Will Campbell, Emory Jones, Harold Perkins, you're not having those conversations about anybody now. So if you need to go spend a million five on a Bryce Underwood, or you need to go drop seven figures to make sure you get DJ Pickett, or you need to go spend a million dollars to get an elite level transfer safety or defensive tackle, you do it and you don't care who you offend. That's what Brian Kelly is saying is the big difference there. So he was also asked why they didn't spend more a year ago. Now, I just answered that for you, but I'll let you hear it from him, and I'll react in just a second. It's Locked on LSU, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. LSU in Oklahoma this weekend, the final game in Tiger Stadium before the Valley sleeps until next September. If you want to be there, Game Time can help make it happen. Remember the Game Time guarantee. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. They also have 24-hour return guarantees. You can return your tickets within 24 hours from the time of purchase for a full credit to your Game, uh, game Time account. No questions asked. You got to use it. Game time is incredible. You can filter only incredible deals on great seats with game time picks. You can see the view from your seat on your phone before you buy. And I love the all-in pricing feature. You turn it on, you toggle it, and it'll show you the total price up front. That's at game time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time picks. Download the game time app, create an account, use the code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem with the code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-C-O-L-L-E-G-E -E for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time. So Brian Kelly acknowledged that they will be more aggressive in the portal and they weren't a year ago. So he was asked, why didn't you spend more money last year? Yeah, all of them are strategic decisions that you make from year to year. And... Um, it, it just didn't present for us in the manner that we felt like we were going to reach last year on some things. Um, and uh, just didn't, I think at the time when we were looking at players that made sense for us, uh, they duplicated a lot of things. Uh, we don't have that duplication in the program anymore. So that's why in certain areas we'll be, we, we'll be very aggressive. Duplication. Okay. Let's talk about some of that. What he means at the receiver position. Would you go add a player in the transfer portal at receiver that mirrored uh, Aaron Anderson, for example, we well, went and added Xavion Thomas. You look at the offensive line. Would you have gone after an offensive lineman when you had four returning starters? Didn't make a lot of sense. Look at what you did add. You went in the portal and you added C.J. Daniels, who's been a nice addition. You went and added Gio Paez because you needed a defensive tackle. But again, you thought you might get back both uh, Makai Wingo and Mason Smith. You added Jair Brown at cornerback, but he hasn't popped. You added Austin Osbury at safety. You added Xavion Thomas, as we mentioned, Jordan Gilbert at safety. You added A.J. Swan at quarterback. And in the second period, you went and added JVR Suggs and Blake Oxendorf at punter. You just didn't go add impact guys. Part of it is what Brian Kelly said, the whole duplication. Another part of it is you didn't have as much money. In one gigantic change from a year ago to now is Taft. 
the Tiger Athletic Foundation recently took over fundraising for Bayou Traditions, the LSU Collective. And in so doing, TAF allowed donations to Bayou Traditions to earn donors TAF points. So while LSU still has a very small number, the number I was told is three, three seven-figure donors to the collective, three seven-figure donors to the collective, what they have been able to do since TAF has gotten involved is they've been able to recruit and engage the $5,000, $10,000, $50,000, $100,000 donors. And each month since the Tiger Athletic Foundation has taken over fundraising, each month subsequent, Bayou Traditions has been able to raise a million dollars minimum per month. That is a massive difference from what they had been doing. So it's built LSU's NIL coffers. And then there's been some very specific targets as well, where you could go to to big donors and boosters and say, we need help with this player, which has allowed LSU to build up their uh, their coffers and how they're, they're handling this. Now, another piece of this that's very important is a question that I asked Brian Kelly. And I asked him the question about who is handling uh, the roster. And we're going to get to Rev Share in just a second. But remember, Brian Kelly is coaching his team. Like, they're playing Oklahoma this week. In less than a week, they're going to play Oklahoma on Saturday. Four days after that is going to be the early signing period. A short time after that, the portal window is going to open. All the while, all the while, LSU has to figure out how they are going to factor in uh, revenue share and how they're going to dispense and disseminate these funds evenly to build out its roster, almost like a, not necessarily like a salary cap, but to steal the word that or phrase that Brian Kelly used. So who's handling that? How is that going? This is what Brian Kelly said. Well, it's, it's uh, Austin Thomas, myself, Frank Wilson, in particular, the three of us are, are working on that on a day-to-day basis. We're having meetings with players. So it starts with retention first of players that have to make decisions relative to whether they're going to move on to the NFL or they're going to stay here. Um, so the first part of that is um, retaining players that you want. The second part of that is the ongoing recruiting process and bringing players into your program through the recruiting process. Uh, the third level is the transfer portal and, and identifying particular positions that you believe that you need to go out and get a mature player that has played snaps at that position uh, at a level that can impact your roster right away. And then the fourth is, you know, who, who are the guys that are, are going to stay uh, on this team? And you're evaluating those players that have stayed above the cut. So there's a lot going on <laughs> As, as we continue to work on our football team uh, to get Ws and, and to have positive outcomes. So there's a lot going on um, right now in college football, uh, and it's caused uh, a lot of gray hairs. It's caused some guys to say, I think I'd rather be doing something else. I'm excited about it. Um, I'm excited about what the roster can look like. I'm excited about what kind of football team we can put on the field. And um, it's going to be a fun couple of months. Maybe a little bit of of finger point at Nick Saban stepping away or Dabo Sweeney, who refuses to conform when he talked about guys maybe getting some gray hairs. But Brian Kelly said there's four pieces there to building this roster. There's retention, meaning veteran guys who might go to the NFL. In in this instance, Harold Perkins, Mason Taylor, Emory Jones are the three that we're looking at. Brian Kelly also said earlier this week, CJ Daniels likely to return. A West Weeks going to return as well. So some veteran players that you're getting back. That's a huge boost. That's going to allow your team to be more veteran. High school recruiting, finishing off this class. LSU even without Bryce Underwood. If they finish off this class or in line to have a, a, a consensus top six class in the country with potentially as many as four or five stars, yes, it stings losing Bryce Underwood, 
but look at the class that you have assembled if you're able to finish it off. He also mentioned the transfer portal, identifying positions where you need immediate impact guys, and then looking at your current roster. Like, who's probably going to go into the portal? Sort of hate to say it this way, but as he said, it, you know, who's not going to make the cut? You're sort of cutting from the bottom. Guys that that you don't think are going to make it that are going to go somewhere else to try to to get you know, have have their hand at a at a college career. So those are the things that they're trying to figure right now. And one of the things that uh, that has been disclosed to me is how LSU is allocating funds to build the roster. And I'd like to share some of that with you when we return. And one more soundbite from Brian Kelly when he was asked about revenue share, which is going to go into effect this summer and how that's going to change this conversation altogether. It's Locked on LSU, your team every day. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. So the other gigantic component of roster building moving forward is going to be revenue share. And I will give you a very abbreviated Cliff's Notes version of this for those who aren't familiar. The house settlement that you've heard a lot of people talk about effectively is going to allow college athletic departments to share in their revenue with their student athletes. These aren't salaries. It's not a you're not a, a, a an employee per se at least not as the government would define it but i'm going to use round numbers if lsu generates 200 million dollars in athletics revenue that's from your conference affiliation and ticket sales and everything right if lsu generates 200 million dollars in revenue a certain percentage up to a dollar amount which is roughly $21 million there, about what it's estimated to be, can be shared with the student athletes. So there's a couple of things that have had to happen. And I've shared this as well. But two years ago, I had a conversation with a very high-ranking LSU athletic administration official. Two years ago. And they told me that it was a foregone conclusion that revenue sharing was going to happen as early as 2025. They were on the money, by the way. And that they were already starting to prepare. So keep in mind... LSU makes $200 million in, in revenue, but they spend $200 million. There's very seldom a surplus. Every dollar in is a dollar out to maximize your athletic department. So what they've had to do is determine, okay, if we have to share round number, $20 million with our athletes, how do we either cut $20 million in expenses or how much higher is revenue going to go to ease that gap? For example, you have a new television contract with the uh, with uh, the the SEC, ESPN, ABC, that will elevate the payout. So every school in the conference is going to make more than they did last year because of this new TV deal. Great. If LSU spends the same that they always did, they'll make more this year. If every all expenses are flat, they'll make more, and that can go toward revenue share. That's probably not going to be everything. So there'll be other line items. Is it recruiting budget? Is it personnel that maybe aren't necessary? Does your travel budget change? A lot of different things that you could cut to lean out a little bit to make sure that you make up those funds. Okay, so the question is then, if you've got round number $20 million, how do you spend that? Well, it's believed that you don't have to have an equal distribution among all the sports. The majority is going to go to football. How much? That remains to be seen the exact number. But what I am 
te- what I am very comfortable in saying is that LSU's, and I've said this on many, many platforms, I'll say it here again for those who haven't heard me, what LSU spent on its 2024 roster, it will more than double that number for its 2025 roster. Now, that revenue share, remember, has to go to football and basketball and baseball and women's basketball and softball and all the different ways that you want to allocate revenue. Now, how you do it is remains to be seen. What I can tell you how LSU has looked at its roster is they effectively have taken it position group by position group as so much to say, like, let's say your roster is a pie. Well, how big of the pie goes to quarterbacks? How big a slice goes to the offensive line? How much of the pie goes to receivers? How much of the pie goes to running backs? How much of the pie goes to specialists and defensive linemen and corners and safeties and linebackers? And you get it. And so they've basically weighted the value. And this is where a guy like Austin Thomas um, come, comes in into, into play. He's, I mean, he's got to effectively decide as, as the general manager how you build your roster with whom you build your roster and how you allocate those funds. So LSU has basically said, let's say we have X amount of money to spend. We'll take this percentage and spend it on quarterbacks. Okay. If we have this dollar amount to spend on quarterbacks, how much does Garrett Nussmeyer get? How much does Ricky Collins get? How much does Colin Hurley get? How much do we allocate for a transfer? Now, and how much did you allocate for Bryce Underwood? Okay. Well, one other thing that I know for a fact they have done is they have slotted value in necessary position groups for transfers. For example, we all know LSU needs an impact interior defensive lineman. So they will have a line in that budget for the the roster budget for 2025 for elite transfer defensive tackle, elite transfer safety, Elite wide receiver, which you may need a game-breaking stretch the field wide receiver. So you have those line items already budgeted for 2025. So whenever somebody you want hits the portal, boom, you can go and say, I've got X allocated for you. And those numbers could potentially grow when you had money allocated for a guy like Bryce Underwood, who now is not signed. So it increases the amount you have to spend to, to lock down the 2025 class and to spend in the transfer portal. Here is Brian Kelly when he was asked on Monday about how revenue share changes things. Well, I mean, I think we can say it's a fait accompli that, that rev share is here, right? I think the long form from the courts is pretty clear in terms of what that's going to look like. I think everybody has got an idea of what those numbers are going to be. Um, you know, that will kick in, you know, sometime in the summer. It's what you do prior to it kicking in. And, and, and that's really where everybody is, is um, keeping their cards close. Um, and because that, that is the accelerator, right? You want to accelerate and be able to retain. You want to be able to go out into the transfer portal. Uh, and you want to be able to do that before revenue sharing. So you can begin to if you will, um, balance off um, what your roster looks like in terms of the numbers when everybody comes into one locker. And, and, and if you just waited to revenue share, it's, it's going to be a different look for, for different players. You can balance things off if you're aggressive here in the next few months, and that's what we plan to be. That is what he's talking about is what I just explained. They have a good sense of what that dollar amount is going to be. They've already allocated it, so they know what they can promise and what they can give to each. Now, if you saw the funny smirk where he said, the interesting thing is going to be what teams do prior, and that's where they're holding cards close to the vest. What he means is this. There is a strong feeling that when revenue share goes into effect July 1st, if that's the date it ends up being, collectives will cease to exist as far as aggressively fundraising. They might just be assumed by the um, by the athletic department, but as an extension, an arm of the athletic department, they can no longer function as they do. 
So if every school has a cap on the dollar amount they can share in the revenue, NIL from the collective, it's thought, will be rolled into that. Now, there's going to be lawsuits, and it'll take time to sort all this stuff out. But effectively, what every school is saying is, I'm going to use some round numbers hypotheticals. Let's say a school has $10 million in their collective. Okay. You get to January 1st, and rev share starts. Well, all that revenue now is capped, and it's coming from the athletic department. What do you do with that $10 million that your collective has? You know what you do? You spend it now. And that's what's happening across college football right now. I had a head of a collective tell me, in his estimation, there would be more money spent between now and July 1st than you can imagine. The, the massive amounts of money that will change hands. And essentially what a lot of schools may be doing is giving some players advances to say, okay, if we're going to promise you a quarter million over a year, over four years, that's a million bucks. Let's just give you a million today. Would you want a million dollars today? Again, a hypothetical. That's the type of thing that's happening right now because there's uncertainty about what those funds currently in the collective could possibly be used for. Now, true NIL can still exist. If a business wants to go to an athlete and do a true NIL deal, they can do it. But can you funnel that through a collective? Can you funnel that through the athletic department? The way that many are interpreting what will happen with revenue share is no. So all that money raised right now, the idea from some is it needs to be spent by July 1st, which is why you're seeing a lot of teams get super aggressive. And that's what Brian Kelly was talking about when he said, what happens prior to rev share is fascinating and teams are holding their cards close to their vest. LSU is prepared to be aggressive in this. You don't need to take my word for it anymore. Brian Kelly told you. LSU knows what they have in their in their coffers for the, for the collective. They know that they went bargain basement on the 2024 roster in the transfer portal, and it hurt them. It cost them. You added, you added pieces, rotational pieces. You didn't add studs. Look, I think Gio Piaz has played great for LSU this year. He's not Walter Nolan. I think Jordan Gilbert has struggled at times, but he's given you a veteran presence at safety. He's not Caleb Downs. CJ Daniels is a really good player. But he's battled through injury. He's been a good leader. He's been a security blanket for Garrett Nussmeyer. He's not Keon Coleman. And that's what LSU is looking at this year saying, we got to go get Caleb Downs. We got to go get Walter Nolan. We got to go get Keon Coleman. We have the money to do it. Let's go do it. And that's going to be the approach once that portal window opens for LSU. But after they polish off this 2025 class, and they've got an extra million and a half to try to solidify it after Bryce Underwood walked out of the door. So go back to where Brian Kelly started this whole thing. Yeah, you want a quarterback. Of course you do. But it's about building that whole roster. And if you get Garrett Nussmeyer back in 2025 as a fifth-year senior and you're able to add this amount of talent to that roster along with the 2024 signing class, which is maturing, the 2025 class coming in, which is full of elite prospects, now all of a sudden you can look at a pretty quicker path to a 12-team playoff for LSU than many might assume. Hope you enjoyed this episode. If anything was unclear, do me a favor, drop me a comment or a question. I'd be happy to answer it in the comments or in a future episode if there's something that could help to clarify. I appreciate it greatly. Hey, thanks so much for making this your first listen every day. We're free, available wherever you get podcasts, of course, on YouTube as well. So please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Rate us, leave a review on YouTube, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you're notified whenever we post a new video, and let a friend know that if they love the Tigers, we got you every day for Locked on LSU, your team every day.